Good morning and welcome to the Cambridge University Land Society's ESG Forum. This is our 10th webinar and um, my name is Ami Kotecha and I'm the founding chair of the COLS ESG and Sustainability Forum. We set this forum up about two years ago as a cross-sector forum in response to the need for thought leadership on the most pressing issues faced by our sector. We felt that discussing sustainability and ESG using a multidisciplinary and cross-sector approach was the right thing to do because it could lead to useful insights due to the potential of value exchange between a variety of stakeholders within our industry sector. And hence, we encouraged an open, open cross-germination of ideas at our panel discussions. I'd encourage you to visit our YouTube channel, our COOL's YouTube channel, to check out any of the previous webinars that we've missed. Please leave your likes and give us feedback on any future topics that, we, that you'd like us to bring forward to you. Today, we are here to discuss the concept of a circular economy. Our expert panelists, led by our expert moderator, Manish Datta, who is the UK Green Building Council's director, will discuss the impact that a robust circular economy can have on addressing climate change. In essence, or conceptually, this would mean that we'd require a systematic change from a continuous waste economy or a continu uh, continuous waste process to a zero waste process. Clearly a very, very high standard to meet. I would like now to invite Manish to introduce our fantastic lineup of panelists and to kick off the discussion. Thanks and over to you, Manish. Thanks, Ami, and hello to everyone. Um, and good morning if you're in our time zone. Otherwise, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this calls webinar. Just a couple of bits of housekeeping before we get into the main content. Please, we want your questions, but do use the Q&A function as opposed to the chat function to pose them. So uh, just that bit of housekeeping. And, and I find always with these webinars, if you, if you go to the top right of your screen and click view and then choose speaker option, that's the best sort of experience that you'll have. So um, what a big topic we've got today and what an illustrious group of uh, experts, world experts, we've got to talk to us about them. I'll introduce them in a little bit, but let me, let me just set out some uh, scene setting as such. So the global extraction of primary materials is expected to triple by 2050. That's how much we will take from nature, according to UNEP. And the urban environment, the, 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 the industry that we mainly work in, is responsible for half of all extracted materials from nature. And in, in the developed world, the buildings and infrastructure sector is also responsible for some 60% of what we uh, underutilized or wasteful use of uh, resources. And this is because, um, as Ami was saying, the urban environment largely operates in a linear single use consumption model, which generates underutilized resources that we as a species call waste. Nature doesn't have any waste, but we as a species, we treat it as waste. But we have got better at formal and informal recycling but we're nowhere near exploiting the potential material, carbon or cost savings from the circular economy. Now, for those that are unfamiliar, and I'm sure there aren't any of you, but just to make sure we're on the same page, the term circular economy uh, is defined in many ways. But I like the definition offered by Letty uh, earlier this week in its recently launched one page guide called Circular Economy for the Built Environment. And I'll post a link to it later. A circular economy is an alternative to the traditional linear economy, which is very, very much based on make use and dispose. And in a circular economy, we keep resources in use for as long as possible. We extract the maximum value from them while in use. We then recover and regenerate products and materials at the end of their service life. So we are losing so much from our linear approach. For example, significant amounts of space in buildings is wasted. In the developed world, the average office is up to 60% unoccupied during office hours, while space in schools and public buildings is more like 72% underutilized. Assets are often demolished and undervalued, re, um, leading to material depreciation, accounting, if you add it all up, to about 2.1 trillion euros of lost value every year. But all of these challenges are also market opportunities, and we'll hear more about this later. Uh, and the good news is that established businesses are changing their business models inspired from the circular economy. For example, there is a developer developing designs to maximize the reuse of structural steel across their property portfolio. One of its projects, it will reuse its existing steelwork 
rather than using virgin steel. And by doing so, it will save circa 90% of the embodied carbon from steel. Customers now can choose to buy light instead of buying lighting systems. At the end of their lifespan, the lighting fitting or the lighting system is returned to the supplier for reuse or recycling. And in Netherlands, you will find the world's to first totally demountable office building. And more and more architects are encouraging the concept of buildings as material banks, where we store materials for reuse in the future. And the governments are taking notice as well. The Dutch government has now introduced tax incentives for developers who register material passports for their buildings and is considering making it a mandatory requirement for all new projects in line with its ambition to achieve circular economy by 2050. But I think what will really trigger growth in this materials reuse type practice is the recognition of an ability to recoup value from those materials. And calculations suggest that on average, the residual value of a building materials equates to about 18% of the original construction cost. And according to a report earlier this year from called Circularity Gap, again, I will drop a link into the chat later, between COP25 in Paris in 2015, and, the, and when the Paris Agreement was of course conceived and COP26 last year in Glasgow, 70% more virgin materials were extracted than the earth can safely replenish. Our take, make, waste economy consumes 100 billion tons of materials a year and wastes over 90% of them. This simply cannot continue. We have a finite one planet. So in today's session, we're going to hear, as I said, from world-respected multi-award winning experts who have been working to implement circular economy principles in their work for many, many years. And I'm delighted to kick off with Martin Powley. Martin, welcome to you. Martin is an associate director and leads Arup foresight team in Europe. He, he's, uh, he's, he's built his experience working in innovation and foresight and management consulting. And over the last eight years, has been working with a number of clients uh, across the public sector and private sector in the built environment. And most recently, and perhaps what we're going to hear most about now, is Martin and, and the team at Arup have worked with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to launch the Circular Buildings Toolkit to bring circular economy for buildings into the mainstream. Welcome to you, Martin. Thanks, Manish, for a very kind introduction. And hello, everyone. Good morning or uh, good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen now um, to give you a five minute introduction into the Circular Buildings Toolkit. Manish mentioned it. Um, it has been developed um, in collaboration with the Adamac Arthur Foundation. Um, it's a very let's say, practical toolkit that is publicly available to everyone in the world. Um, so you can literally access it directly after this, this call. We launched it um, during COP in Glasgow as a pre-launch and uh, in March this year um, officially. And um, we are kind of overwhelmed by kind of the use of the tool. Almost every, let's say, stakeholder group in the construction and real estate value chain is kind of looking at it, is adopting it, is testing it. Um, and uh, that's um, super exciting um, development, obviously. Um, just to, to um, not to repeat, but to, to build on what, what Manish, Manish was currently was just saying, um, if we look at, um, at building um, uh, design, um, what we see at the moment or what we define as best practice, green or sustainable design, is obviously um, not enough. Um, it still um, uh, comes along with um, ecological losses. Yeah? Um, there are a lot of um, external costs that we are not um, uh, internalizing. Um, there are still compromises uh, with respect to the environment to carbon. And that's why we believe we need to move um, towards a restorative and regenerative um, design practices. And we believe that um, the principles of the circular economy uh, enable that. Yeah, we've been trained um, to um, bring down the operational carbon, but we have forgotten about the, um, the value of materials and also the embodied energy that is in materials. And that's why we need to shift that focus and really um, widen up the scope. That's pretty much um, to say why we have been also, um, uh, let's say, motivated. And if we look at, um, let's say, the more um, or the wider economic gains, and some of them were already mentioned, I think at the moment, what is motivating stakeholders to adopt those principles? There are maybe three categories. Um, some is 
Uh, one is obviously risk mitigation. I mean, in Europe, there's a taxonomy in place now that is going to be legally binding from 2023 onwards. Um, so um, stakeholders, asset managers, insurances really want to make sure they comply with those criteria. Some of them want to be more, um, uh, become more lean and more green and, and increase their return on capital, reduce operational costs. But I think the holy grail is to use that framework um, uh, really um, to uh, unlock growth opportunities, opportunities for innovation, new products, new systems, new business models, attracting new customer groups. I think that's really, um, that should be really at the heart of, of adopting those principles. So how can the, um, the Buildings Toolkit help with that? When we developed it, um, we had three objectives. First of all, we wanted to make it practical. Um, we felt that the the principles of a circular economy are um, very high level, if you like, and we really wanted to, to translate that um, to a level that practitioners, real estate practitioners can really understand that um, and, and kind of uh, develop their, their designs, their strategies, their concepts based on that. Um, we wanted to obviously align that with external policies um, so that we can kind of make sure that Everything that is developed now is really future proof. Um, and obviously, we wanted to kind of create that framework um, um, for innovation and, and positive impact and really also guide the users through a priority and hierarchy. Um, because we've seen too many, let's say, pavilions with, with reused doors um, claiming to be the world first circular building. But we really need to be um, honest here. There is a clear hierarchy, um, and I'm going to introduce you into that hierarchy in a second. Um, so looking at the toolkit, um, and again, I mean, you can access it literally now, um, maybe not on parallel. Um, there are three components here. First is learn, second is engage, and third one is act. So you can familiarize yourself with all those principles. You can then kind of run workshops within your own company, and you can up upload and benchmark your project um, using the toolkit. Coming to the framework, I mean, at the very highest level, um, we believe building nothing um, is, is obviously the most important um, aspect. And that uh, kind of echoes what Munish was saying in terms of increasing the building um, uh, utilization. Um, optimizing buildings for long-term value, um, another um, critical aspect. Um, designing for longevity, for adaptability, for disassembly. Then increase the efficiency in terms of reducing unnecessary components, increasing material efficiency, and then focusing on kind of using the right materials in terms of non-toxic and, and so on and so forth. Um, so users have open access to those practical guidelines and metrics, and they can take those strategies uh, or the ones that fit best to their asset strategy and, and kind of really use that also as a tool to facilitate those internal conversations. And that's it. I mean, there are um, further components like a case study um, library, like workshop materials, like templates. So I really encourage you to use that because what we want to, wanted to avoid is that um, kind of design and real estate strategy teams across the world reinvent the wheel with every project. Um, so all the knowledge is there. Um, it's, it's really the time to adopt that, test it, and, and scale it up. I think that's my key message. Um, so um, it is time to act, register your project, create your account, add your project, and have fun with that journey. Thank you so much, Martin. We'll return to you uh, for some questions later. And I, do, I would like to encourage uh, all of our delegates to post your questions via the Q&A function, please do, do get them in as you hear from our speakers. I'm sure this is provoking lots of thought behind uh, inside of you. Um, I'm now delighted to turn to Duncan Baker-Brown, founder of Baker-Brown Architects. Um, Duncan, you're a practicing architect, academic, environmental activist, author of books um, published by Reba, um, and have delivered lots and lots of live projects which have won numerous accolades. Um, perhaps we're going to hear a little bit from you about the Brighton Waste House, uh, which is an, one of the case studies that I came across quite early on and has inspired me. So without further ado, welcome to you, Duncan. Uh, thank you, Manish uh, and colleagues, and uh, good day to everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so someone could tell me if they can see it.
Yeah, it's coming through now, Duncan. If you turn it to presenter mode, then we should be good. Perfect. Okay, good. okay so I'm actually going to start with some good news. Um, if you're in the construction sector, you're in a very impactful industry. And so there's this lovely statistic that if you design a 10 meter by 10 meter concrete slab and you make it 50 millimeters thinner than normal, you'll save as much carbon as avoiding meat for a year. We really are in the right place to make big, good decisions. So did you know the construction sector, Munish mentioned it earlier, but it consumes 50% of all raw materials mined and harvested every year. Uh, and it's the mining and harvesting of these materials that are causing the environmental destruction associated with current mass extinction of species. In the UK alone, we create two, 600 million tonnes of products a year we consume. Uh, this generates about 200 million tonnes of waste. This is across all sectors. 60% of this waste is from the construction sector. That's 120 million tonnes of material going to landfill and incineration every year. And 45% of all carbon emissions are to do with the construction sector. Some more good news. Lots of people are appreciating this and realising there are other ways of doing. There's lots in the press all the time about never demolishing buildings, retrofit. Retro reuse is a big deal. People are sticking their hands to tarmac, et cetera. It's a big political issue. People are listening. People are winning the biggest prizes in architecture with the slogans, never demolish, never replace. Um, this is interesting. Uh, more people are understanding this sort of thing. That's a, a sort of a visual of an open cast copper mine. Explain me how much copper you get out of the hole that size. I mean, the resources that get thrown away just to create that amount of copper. We need to think about doing things in a different way. Uh, I coined this phrase, mining the Anthropocene. We, re we need to work with the stuff that's already been processed, the materials that already have the embodied carbon footprint, ecological footprint. And that, well, if we do that, if we reuse and focus on that, we can leave our forests and natural landscapes uh, to replenish themselves. We'll probably have to nurture them as well. But we just do what I say here, mine the Anthropocene, clean up our oceans, have a look at landfill sites, but crucially rework the stuff that's already been built. I'm not going to talk about the circular economy. Munich did a fine job with that already. But my point of view is that we actually know what to do. And our cities are the hope for the future because that's where so much stuff comes. It's where everything comes together. And at the moment, it's linear. It comes together, brushes next to each other, whether that's energy, food, resources of all sorts. We need to make sure those linear systems that turn back on themselves as circular ones. And can consider, for example, cities as material stores for the future. And with that in mind, this is a case study. This isn't a pavilion though. This is a permanent uh, building on campus at the University of Brighton that was completed in 2014. It was built by students and apprentices, and it was actually the world's first permanent building made from uh, material other people threw away and it's also carbon negative it creates 30 percent more energy than it consumes it was actually um, a, a sort of a, a learning module that i teach at the university of brighton part-time and we actually set this challenge of designing a building made out of construction waste because at the time for every five houses we were building in the uk one house worth of waste went to landfill and incineration. So this is actually a student's uh, attempt at designing a sort of wall system using waste materials. And we ran with that idea. Uh, we also partnered City College Brighton and Hove, which we, we went to see their uh, facilities. They teach uh, construction skills, among other things. And they had a two-story workshop where every year they build a house and take it down at the end of the year. They said they would gladly help us build the waste house because they wouldn't have to take it down. So this is a very blurry shot, but this is the sort of numbers we were working with all the time. We had over 360 students work on this project. And this is, the, um, this is um, getting them up to speed with health and safety on site. So you've got a combination of uh, uh, design students, architects, uh, apprentices, and building students all in the same room. How often do you get that cross sector altogether? Another blurry image, but it's a film. It's a still from a film from a city college student um, who carpentry student who's only sixteen years old. Is part of the team that was making the timber frame for the waste house, which was made out of uh, damaged ply and secondhand bits of timber. Uh, here's a, the typical shot from site. So all that material there. Uh, you can see rather large columns, rather large, chunky um, beams. The reason it's large is because when you're using secondhand material, we learned this on the job, 
in this case it was ply, you don't know the actual strength of it. You don't, if you don't know the provenance of it, you have to assume it's the weakest stuff out there. Um, but that's carpentry students with interior architects. We got young kids involved. Um, and what was interesting, initially the challenge was to prove that we could use construction waste uh, to build this um, two-story, what is a teaching facility. Um, but then we were partnering with uh, Freegal UK who are sourcing material for us. And as you can see, these kids are holding lots of plastic stuff. Some of it you would have not uh, realized was still with us, such as VHS videos. Um, and so we started thinking this building could be a sort of vessel containing uh, products with out of end, uh, without an end of life strategy. And this was before Blue Planet 2. So we were raising awareness of, um, of things that are made of plastic that we all know now are, uh, are still with us. Um, we had a sort of summer school as well. This, this building took only a year to build. It came in on budget and on time, but this was, we had 50 students that worked uh, throughout the summer. And it really did um, that summer of 2013, uh, 2013 when it was um, halfway through being completed, we really uh, did move the project on. Um, this is uh, four of the students that became apprentices because of the work they did on the waste house. Um, and this is the, if in between the columns and in the thickness of the walls, this is where we started storing this material that would have uh, otherwise uh, been incinerated. And here you can see the, uh, some of the 4,000 DVDs and VHS videos. Um, we also stored uh, the other materials such, and the, the point was to raise awareness. Do you realize this stuff exists? So here we've got, uh, we had two tons of denim, which is actually a very good insulator, but it, it was interesting the story behind this denim because it was a company that imported ready-made uh, jeans from China and um, uh, cut, imported them to the UK, cut the legs off, and then was the largest seller of shorts for uh, uh, music festivals. But then, of course, had all these denim legs, which they threw away. Uh, this was an amazing story. We were asking for toothbrushes because we thought everybody's got waste toothbrushes. And we did a call for toothbrushes, and Gatwick Airport contacted us, and they collected 25,000 toothbrushes in only four days. And they collected them off the airplanes that landed at Gatwick Airport, the, the transatlantic ones. So, you know, it, people flying from New York were given a toothbrush by uh, Virgin Airlines. Of course, they didn't use it. And just you think about the, um, the life cycle of these toothbrushes, it's a fossil fuel processed into plastic, processed into toothbrush, put on an airliner, flown across the Atlantic, thrown away and incinerated once it lands in the UK, and it is absolutely dumb. Um, we had other things like these, we were given a thousand vinyl banners and we, for two or three months, we didn't know what we were gonna do with these. Initially, we used them just to protect the site to keep it um, watertight, but then we were worked with Kingspan Insulation Company and we used them as a permanent vapor control layer. Um, also, while the house was being constructed, we. Uh, we've collected ply and timber from the University of Brighton campus and made this nine meter high waste hose, which was part of uh, EcoBuild um, uh, in 2013. And even the paint on that um, structure there is secondhand paint. There are companies now that collect secondhand paints. You know, we, we waste nearly 50 million liters of paint a year, or we don't use it, it hangs around in pots in our garages. Um, but that waste totem became the upstairs uh, in, uh, internal finish of the, of the waste house, which, like I said, is actually a teaching facility. Um, we, there was a bit of innovation as well. Well, quite a lot of it was innovation, but this was interesting. We were, uh, we're testing the sort of um, uh, fireproofness of carpet tiles. So on site, on campus, uh, Grand Parade in Brighton, uh, a couple of the studios were being, having their carpet tiles removed. And we, um, we were looking at how we could reuse the over 2,000 carpet tiles. And here we've got um, a building control officer in the uh, red helmet uh, watching a fire test of these um, carpet tiles, which actually performed really well. So we used them to clad the outside of the building. So at one level, I'm going to wrap up the, this, this building, which was actually a building that diverted over 55 tons of material from landfill and incineration. It's actually a permanent teaching facility. It's an ongoing research project, which has attracted numerous uh, interreg and other research projects. And at the moment, we're looking at turning construction waste and other waste, such as um, this is a, a, um, uh, 
a restaurant near the waste house uh, that throws away 50,000 oyster shells a year. We're turning that into other materials for the construction sector. And here are tiles that are cladding one part of the waste house was put on a, a year or so ago. And in effect, they're concrete tiles, but they're made of 100% oyster shells. And this work is actually impacting on real projects. This is a project in the East End of London where the clients, um, instead of paying for the spoil from the site to be thrown away, that spoil has been compacted and turned into bricks for another project. This is a developer in London. And this is a similar thing, hydraulically compacted spoil from a site. This is in Ghent uh, for the new design museum there. This material is hydraulically compacted. It's not fired, so the carbon footprint, as you can see on the right there, is a lot less. And this is for the, uh, the Ghent Design Museum. Um, there are bigger projects. It's not just one-off small projects that are employing these principles now. And I could talk for another two hours about that. Because at the moment, I'm, I've just finished the research for my new book, which is the second edition of the Reuse Atlas. And there are big, big projects out there. And it's really interesting on and I can ask answer questions around this and how they are being facilitated financially and otherwise. Thank you very much. Wow, Duncan, if if I needed anyone to show me the art of the possible, you've definitely done that there. And, and I never tire <laughs> of listening to that case through the Brighton Waste House. Um, I've posted a link for everyone to dig deeper into that. Thank that, you. Thank you very much for that presentation. So we move from uh, sort of an architectural sort of design point of view to actually a more business and marketplace point of view. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Mayel Karuni, CEO of Globe Chain, founder and CEO of Globe Chain, um, the reuse marketplace that connects enterprises to nonprofits and SMEs to redistribute unneeded items, uh, generating data in the process. Um, May, welcome to you. Uh, you previously have a background in investment banking and asset management. So this, you know, it, you're perfect to talk about how we can commercialize and, and really uh, create a marketplace for reused materials. So warm welcome to you. Yeah, thank you. And hi, everybody. Yeah, so um, I'll give you a little bit of background on why I set up Globe Chain. So obviously, I was working at an investment bank, and we moved offices across the road. And the irony, actually, we used to fundraise for property funds. So we owned a lot of commercial uh, property in London and um, they uh, asked us to pick our new carpet tiles, chairs, tables, whatever we may have and um, I just said to them you know why are you what are you doing with all the furniture and the carpets because we were keeping the buildings and they basically said they were just going to dispose of them this was you know going back kind of like seven eight years uh, you know where banks could kind of spend a lot of money and just sustainability really wasn't a word nor was reuse and I just thought why has no one digitalized waste and connected um, companies to non-profits and small businesses to redistribute unwanted assets, inventory and items. So that's really how Globe Chain came about and um, set it up seven years ago. Obviously, I went to a venture capital company going, give me some money. And they all said no, because one of the questions was, what's your market cap? And um, there wasn't one. I looked everywhere for the industry figures on reuse. Obviously, reuse wasn't a thing. There was recycling stats, but very few. So I thought, right, I'm going to show how this is an economy. And, um, you know, I truly believed in kind of commercial with a conscience where industries would move away to what we see now as circular economy. So um, basically set up a very basic site. Um, one of our first clients, uh, which actually doesn't exist anymore, but it was um, the largest retailer in the UK at the time was Arcadia Group that owned Topshop. Um, and I went to them and said, have you got a problem with furniture, fixtures and fittings? And they were like, we, we don't we don't have any office furniture, but we incinerate a lot of fixtures and bespoke mannequins and, and things like that. And it turns out, you know, organisations like them spend quite a few million dollars a year on um, incineration of these very expensive fixtures, as you well know. So um, the way Globe Chain works is a company will list, um, take a photo of the items and the products that they would ordinarily dispose of in landfill. They would take a photo, list them on our marketplace. We send alerts to all our members. We have 10,000 now. And um, they, whoever wants them will see the items, request them and pick up for free. So imagine it's like eBay for business. 
um, but we do something really unique. We generate ESG data on the impact of where the items go. So for those of you, I'm sure you know what ESG is now, um, environment social governance data, it's used on three levels in the market now. Um, sustainability and waste reporting, tax offsetting, and on really high level, credit financing, bond risk, share pricing, IPO valuations. Um, and you're seeing a lot more companies taking out bonds based on their ESG um, for financing purposes. Um, we're actually also recognised under BRIAM and lead points as well. Um, and um, over the last few years, what we've seen is a shift um, from obviously to the basic office furniture, our main sector now is the built environment and construction. So 70% of the materials that get redistributed through the system are things like um, carpet tiles, flooring, fire doors, kitchen units, ceiling tiles, lighting. Uh, we've done uh, big things like um, an air bridge for Heathrow Airport all the way through to uh, a computer and server units. Um, and um, due to kind of the network effect of having 10,000 members, the most sought after items are, re are requested actually within 20 minutes. So we say give it 24 hours and um, you'll have quite a few requests for the bulk of the products. Um, what we do is we track the items so we know the quantities, who's taken it, what they've done with it. And then we use machine learning to predict and product recognize the items that get listed. And then on the back of the end, we generate this data. Um, and I've got one, um, I've just got some very quick slides on an example of a case study just to show you what that looks like. I'll just show you from this one. So this is, um, we, um, from, for our services, we have external reuse, which is basically giving items externally to the general public and um, the charities. And then internal reuse is a global system which acts like an asset inventory system where um, we find con contractors, landowners will use it on their whole portfolio and be able to share and reuse within their own supply chain and subcontractors. Um, this is an example of a client of ours. Um, a lot of you may know them, British Land. So British Land came on board early last year and we do the majority of their portfolio now from strip outs to new developments. Um, I've put some images of the types of quality and the items that get stripped out of these, build these commercial buildings and um, where they went, uh, 24 hours, all requested. Um, lighting, for example, went to libraries and schools. Um, we've got um, domestic violence, homelessness for um, lighting, stairs, metals. And then as you can see, those kitchen units went to a food hub space to, to supply 28 food banks. Um, this is the results of um, what happened there. So this was over three weeks. They, did, they actually diverted more, around 200,000 kilos. 89% was reused and the rest was upcycled and a little bit of the um, metals were recycled that British Land didn't want. And, it's, and British Land worked out it saved them 20% of their waste cost savings by just doing that over three weeks with the contractor. Um, my favourite story is um, fire doors went to Ghana to a school to ensure the students are protected from the local wildlife in the rural area, which got me thinking what happens there. Um, every time someone takes items, we ask them for a case study, they can't request more. And you get amazing stories and videos and images of where things go. And the client or the, the lister, if you like, is responsible for um, uh, um, picking who they want. So we disclose if they're a charity, a business or an individual, who are the quantities they give and they dictate the, um, uh, the pickup time. Um, to give you a scope of how much we've actually done, we've done 5 million items through the system. Um, that equates about 63 million kilos and about the savings for those secondary materials were around 450 million dollars. Um, and I wanted to show you that. I'm just going to come off the screen because um, when we first started, you know, everyone was like, this is not a business model. You can't monetize it. And we um, we took probably about three years to understand the business model and how to compare it with waste costs and skip costs and waste management. Um, and what we found was there wasn't... Um, you had to really have a new business model for this. And really there were like three challenges. It was behavior change, 
who was getting the right people on board and procurement um, was a challenge because we're class of software. We're not, we're not a waste broker because we don't touch the goods. Reuse doesn't need waste license notes. Um, so over the years, we had a lot of um, transparent conversations with the clients to ask them, okay, if you disposed of those items, how much would it cost you? We have, um, we have a, con um, a construction and property firm on board that um, does probably around 400 projects a year. They have over a thousand employees using the system internally within the project managers, the subcontractors, and then obviously externally within the UK. And they um, did a, a costing study and they worked out, they spent six million pounds in British pounds a year, uh, over three years, beg your pardon, on direct uh, skip or dumpster costs. Over the three years indirect costs, so that costs like logistics, warehousing, labour, it equated to £60 million. Pounds. And even by using globe chain and redistributing 7 to 10% of materials, they were saving a significant amount of money directly through that. Um, and uh, to give you an example, the first seven listings they listed uh, broke, any, broke even on what they what, what globe chain charges them per annum. So over the years, we developed a subscription model for ad hoc and um, multiple projects, as well as project fees based on square footage, because we were able to collect data and understand the quality and the quantity of materials per square footage of each um, building. And then on the back of that, um, as a few people have discussed, a material passport seems to be a big thing. So the next stage is looking at things like steel and how we can verify and automate it through um, using digital up to a point and for, for contractors to be able to pass that type of items. Um, we are seeing contractors using other contractors that potentially could have been competitors um, and taking materials off there too. So um, I just wanted to share that it is happening. Um, it's really big in the built environment. And, um, you know, that there are a few things like, you know, where do you sit in procurement and costings on the cost centre as well? Um, and I'm happy to, like, answer questions on that. And also the system um, covers you for kind of liabilities and compliance. And the biggest um, uh, kind of um, question that we get asked is the speed. And because, you know, the contractors on the sites, you know, have very small windows to do things or they have no storage or no loading bays or the security aspects of entering buildings. Um, but we developed a system which is ongoing on how like, with a special logistics section, we offer couriers through an API integration. We can also integrate into software and pull that information. So it's, it's obviously a work in progress. We're in UK, Spain now, New York and Texas for the external, obviously globals everywhere. Um, but um, we find it, it's been quite an exciting journey on commercializing it and getting people understanding the value of that ESG and how people win tenders and RFPs on the back of um, it putting, say, a reuse mandate within it. And it also helps with planning permission and, um, and so on. Um, so yeah, that is us. Thank you for listening. Fabulous, thank you, May. That is so inspiring and um, you know a great case study of how the market is changing and responding to the circular economy challenge and opportunity. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you for some more discussion later. Uh, our, our final speaker um, is Nick Isles. Nick is Associate Director and Principal Sustainability and Waste Consultant at Savills. Nick has a strong track record of uh, working with uh, the financial, property management and construction sectors uh, and has recently worked with uh, clients, Land Securities, King's Cross and at White City Place. So really um, responding to client demand for, um, for circular economy. Uh, welcome to you, Nick. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can see my screen okay. That's great, Nick, thank you. Fabulous. So um, just so inspiring to hear about um, all of the, uh, the, the, the intellectual groundwork which has been done to establish the business case and the benefits of applying circular economy principles within the, the built environment. Um, and really interesting to hear from May on some of the, the very specific applications uh, to solve specific challenges uh, which Globe Chain can offer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna um, without attempting to cover the same information which Martin and Minish have already done far more eloquently that, than I could, just to pick out a couple of themes here and, uh, and then talk about how uh, circular economy is understood 
and is being interpreted by the clients that we work with across the property management life cycle. So the key stat on this screen, um, from my point of view, is the one on the, the lower left. 80% of the buildings standing today will be in use in 50 years. And this brings together these, these two key things. One is the decarbonisation of the built environment, speaking to this point that something like 11% of global greenhouse gas emissions are embodied in the built environment and the need to reduce the raw material demand um, uh, for the 50% of the natural resources which are used in, in buildings. Um, so what that speaks to is the need to think about refurbishment of existing assets and ways to decarbonise existing assets uh, and integrate circular economy principles through building refurbishment in addition to through uh, new construction. So I think from our point of view, working with clients across the property management life cycle, I think it would be fair to say that levels of awareness and of understanding and of ambition vary quite widely. Um, uh, and because of that, I think we're on the early stages of a journey. There's examples of really good practice, clear leaders um, and examples of organisations that are the beginning stages of this journey. Um, for some organisations, circularity is understood for, for what it actually is, which is you know, a fundamental transformative way in which they do business. Um, for others, it's seen perhaps as uh, slightly better recycling, uh, slightly better waste performance. And equally, I think there'll be a healthy range of opinion on whether it's a box to tick or is an integral part of an organisation's vision of itself. Um, what we do see is that the circular economy is being increasingly identified as a key material issue for organisations which are going through an ESG, environmental social governance strategy development process. Um, and lots of organisations are talking about commitments to circularity and to becoming circular, but without necessarily a clear roadmap on how to get there or clear targets or metrics to track their progress along that road. So uh, the picture is developing. Uh, and like I say, some clear leaders um, and other organisations that are the starting point of their journey. Um, it's also, I think, very important to make the distinction which others have made already between existing assets and, and new developments. So for existing assets, um, made, uh, made very eloquently the, the business case for integrating solution, solution, solutions which address specific problem cases. And these really are the drivers for change here, I think, is to, to reduce um, operational waste footprints and reduce operational waste management costs. And there are very practical applications here around how reuse platforms such as Globechain can be used, how product traceability can be integrated, and there are various businesses starting up in this space which allow uh, products um, to be introduced which are reusable to replace single-use products, for those products to be traced, to re be recovered, and to be reused again and again. And of course, as Manish has said, um, some real-world opportunities and solutions that speak to the products as a service concepts of lighting, flooring, furniture systems, and, and so on. On the new development side, I think it's much, uh, much more about being driven in London, especially by the, uh, the London plan, which has introduced new requirements for circular economy statements for, for, uh, for certain strategically interesting, uh, interesting projects. And that's very much shaping the discussion, shaping the debate um, outside of London, where those requirements are not yet in place. You know, the picture looks a little bit different. Um, but in our sentences that things will change there and we'll start seeing similar requirements coming in over time. Um, and of course, there is a need for tools and resources to bridge the gap from theory to practice. So Martin's work with Arup and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on the toolkit is absolutely key to this, to provide solutions um, so that the, uh, the costs and the benefits of various um, reuse, uh, recycling options, which can be factored into new developments can be considered in a, in a robust and in a transparent way, which will allow for demonstrable reductions in the energy embodied in new developments. And I think you know, perhaps more recently and, and highlighted by some of the, uh, the global issues and the cost of living and the raw material price rises that we're seeing at the moment, I think there's interest there in adaptability and supply chain resilience through more local sourcing, through the use of recycled and recovered materials in, in construction as well. So there's a, a future briefing element there. Overall, 
I would say it's something of a of a curate's egg. It's it's good in part. Um, again, clear examples of um, of organisations who are really embracing circularity and, and applying it in meaningful ways. Um, but much to be done, I think, on taking other organisations through that journey and understanding what the circular economy means for them, which speaks to the the risks and opportunities which they have as a business. Thanks very much, Nick. I'm going to virtually invite all the speakers again uh, to join us. If you could stop sharing, Nick, that would be great. Thank you. I'm just going to invite um, all the speakers now back into the room by pinning them. Um, I think this will work fine. Just give me one second while I do that. Uh, and Martin, great. Welcome to you again. What brilliant uh, presentations. Thanks, Nick, for your client perspective there at the end. It was really useful. We've had some great questions. Um, I had some uh, ready to go, but I don't think I'll need to ask them because we've got so many good ones from our um, delegates. Thank you to all of those that have posed them. I'm going to start with one that, um, that you, Duncan, have kindly part answered, but I want to open it up to the entire panel, which is uh, from Anne Claire Harper. So for, if you're looking on the Q&A, then look on the answer tab. On the circular economy, how do we persuade investors and investment managers to do nothing when their remuneration um, and the remuneration of their advisors depends on quite the opposite? So uh, the focus is on residential in the question, but I'd love to hear from you, Martin, first, and then we'll go around our panelists just to get an answer to that one. How do we incentivize from a you know, financial point of view, people that are, you know, contracts and uh, the model at the moment doesn't incentivize them for circular economy. Martin. Yeah, good question. I mean, one um, one perspective, um, or maybe there are two perspectives. One is that what we see in the in the in the world is that more and more bonus payments are linked to is ESG performance. I think that's a very promising sign, and we see that across organizations, and it will ultimately also swap into our industry. That's one thing, and the other thing is that. Um, Building nothing doesn't mean that um, you're unable to create and, and capture value. I think it's more um, towards using existing assets um, and increasing the capacity utilization. And I think that's going to be an exercise which is going to be increasingly important. And if we look at what the Green Building Councils, for instance, um, do, they will um, require um, pre uh, demolishing audits. Yes, you really have to prove if you want to develop a new site, if the existing building. Um, cannot be reused and cannot get a second life or a third life. So I think it's a transition, basically. And in five years, that discussion will be different um, to now. That would be my take. Thanks, Martin. Um, I'd love to get your perspective, Duncan. Well, Duncan, you provided a perspective, but for is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I think as different parts of the construction industry have got a potential to, in a way, uh, grow their business uh with this situation for example uh companies responsible for, for demolition are companies who will be responsible for deconstruction and that uh, that is a um you know that's a higher level a high in the hierarchy of things um a high level activity so um i've been in uh interviewing over the last couple of weeks uh, people who are uh, parts of networks of uh, demolition companies who are focusing on deconstruction now and they're doing that because uh, is a big business opportunity. We do need to adapt um, our current building stock for climate to be, to be climate resilient, to uh, not consume so much um, energy in use. And so, uh, from my point of view, there are numerous reasons why the existing built in built environment needs to be adapted. We don't need we need to do uh, work that has less negative impact on the planet. That's not necessarily less work. Um, so in a way, it's, it's not not doing nothing, it's doing different. Thank you, Duncan. May? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we work with a lot of landlords and private trusts that, you know, that hold um, portfolios. And one thing we've seen is, um, you know, it's, it's the unseen bit of on the ground, right? It's like, how do they finance these projects? It's through bonds, it's through bank financing. And, you know, the, the way it works is analysts will uh, do due diligence on that company and have a set of metrics on that ESG data. And it's very broad, right? Energy, water, um, all the way through to the sustainability. And they're looking more and more on the resources side. So the, the, the better um, data and evidence and transparency a company can show 
to those banks and, and financing and private equity firms, uh, the better rates they're going to get with their financing, you know, and the better planning permission you're going to get. Like, so, you know, in London, you know, if you have a reuse mandate, your planning permission, um, you know, you get an extra credit, basically, <laughs> and from a planning permission perspective. So um, things are changing. It's really like three drivers, consumer, government, you know, legal, and um, data is driving it. So it needs to be um, um, there needs to be a lot of evidence for it, but that's how we've done it. And then what happens is the, the landlords or the, the landowners, they will put that suggestion into the tenders and have a target on it, whether that's a percentage or specific materials, that whether they want to reuse it, recycle it, upcycle it, or bring it back into their buildings. And so what happens then, there's a ripple effect with the contractors because the contractors differentiate themselves, now have to go and educate them on say why they want a reuse marketplace on board. So what they do is then they come to us, they, 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 they understand why this company wants this and what ESG is, and then they put it back in the tenders and put a costing to it. So then you start understanding and making them work out like, is this gonna cost me extra to pull out materials or look at a different resource? Um, and we're finding that has had a domino effect once they've used the system or something's worked, they're actually implementing it a lot. And a lot of them are win winning awards and bids on the back of um, just um, doing that extra bit because they understand how ESG is important to the, to the client. So um, I'd say that's the way you have to look at it from, from, from the perspective, like top bottom. Thanks, May. We're gonna stay with you because there's a really nice point. What struck me about your case study was the human side of it, how you were connecting real human need with uh, underutilization. That was really, you know, this, the Sierra Leone example, the Ghana example, the food banks example. And there's a great question here from Tom Crane. Thank you, Tom, which is, are there any tools out there which measure what I call the co-benefits of circular economy almost, which is the positive social and human rights impact of circular economy alongside the obvious environmental benefits? Yeah, I mean, it's the Social Value Act, right, or community engagement part. If you're doing an infrastructure product or a rail project, um, you know, one of the things you're looking at is how do you benefit the community, right? Um, the, it, there's, there's type, kind of two types of software, if you like, that will manage this. There's one that's an algorithm for consumers, right, to plant trees. And then there's, there's people like us that actually, this is seven years worth of data, <laughs> do you know, that we've collected from raw people and then machine learning on understanding the secondary values of goods. And, you know, now it's automated. So um, this is how we do it. We know who's listing, what they're doing with it, who collected, where did it go, the sector impact. We know the sustainable development goals you're hitting, you know, because that, as you said, it could be if a client just wants to offer it locally in their area, homelessness, refugees, domestic violence, you know, you, you've got medical charities, education, schools, um, whereas some will give more internationally uh, because it's very specific material. So we work with the NHS and do medical equipment on the real estate side. You can't reuse medical equipment in the UK, but obviously legislation is different abroad. So we have a network of charities in Africa, Eastern Europe that will redistribute um, those materials. So um, yeah, and that we found that was the most powerful thing, right? And um, there was the cost saving element for sure, but the power of the value of the social impact once people start giving, you know, there's that human element at the end of the day, right? You know that, you know, it's a new life from wanted stuff, not new life for the product, but new life for somebody, you know, that could, that saves people thousands of pounds that they could put to an employment, employing someone or upskilling someone, creating, we had um, water valves and they got created into coffee tables, you know, with an apprenticeship. Um, scheme. So um, it, it just shows you the kind of the creativity and the kind of like infinite positive, you know, people are really creative. <laughs> and, you know, what you think is waste isn't, you know, um, I'd say the only thing that's um, a challenge to go and it's probably more on the recycling and smaller scale is um, if you put broken electricals on, because a lot of people don't understand, you know, how to pack test. But, um, you know, we have different types of members, right? There are charities that do pack test things. Um, on that side but that and I think I saw an, um, a question on asbestos I don't know if that was related we don't do hazardous materials so the contractor obviously needs to make a decision on that from a compliance and health and safety and would never never list that anyway on our system 
What it feels like to me, May, is that you're constantly finding solutions to every challenge that's thrown to you. That's fantastic to hear. I, I want to build on the social value aspect of this a little bit more because it's often under sort of discussed in many ways and, and come to you, Duncan. Some of the pictures that really struck me from your presentation were about how you've uh, become an educator through that Brighton Waste House project and continue to do so. It's a live learning lab, I think, in many respects. Um, is, are we teaching, um, you know, the future generations of architects and designers, engineers, um, investors enough about the importance of circular economy? I, I, I'm going to guess the answer is no. I suppose the question really is how, how can we do more of, more of that in the education system? I, I think that is actually the, the, the big question uh, and the big challenge, actually, more to the point. So, um, yeah, I can talk about how amazingly successful and impactful the Waste House was as a project. You know, uh, 750 school kids came to visit the site in a year. 360 apprentices and students worked on the project. They're now out in the construction sector wondering why they're not doing other waste houses, you know, but they are impactful. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got a role at um, the RIBA. I've just accepted to be a, a co-chair of uh, a climate emergency action hub and the, the, the education of our design uh, designers in the construction sector is paramount. I think what is exciting is this is so much being published at the moment and out there, um, you know, whether it's uh, your organization, um, when it's the UK Green Build Building Council or, or Letty, you mentioned Letty earlier. I mean, it's so impactful at the moment. I don't know if it's because we've all been in lockdown and had time to read these documents, but you know, Letty has really shook, uh, shook up the uh, construction sector at the moment. And so I think there's a greater understanding of the need to under, uh, to engage with these issues. So I'm finding that the door is definitely ajar. Um, but yeah, I've got a role at the University of Brighton as climate literacy champion. And I know there's a lot of people, students who are saying, we're not getting the right education. You're not teaching us what we need to know to practice whatever we want to practice in industry uh, in the very near future. But I think uh, people are listening, educators are listening and things are changing. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, we've got four or five minutes to go. So I'm going to come to you, Martin, and then Nick, uh, both of you really for this set of questions, which is uh, from Geraint, which is around, um, we're at the very beginning of the S-curve. I think, Nick, you said that, um, which, which is spot on. What are those enablers? What are the system enablers? And I'd like you within that to comment about the role of legislation and both local and national government within that. Martin and then Nick, please. Yeah, I mean, that's something I can be very clear about. Um, I mean, we've been talking and discussing about circular economy uh, in, in our industry here in Germany for almost 10 years, but only as uh, the, the uh, taxonomy in Europe um, kicked in as part of the Green Deal, defining very clear um, technical screening criteria, disclosure requirements. Only then the entire value chain moved from asset managers, asset holders, insurance, as architects, developers, um, and I think that was um, and still is a game changer. So in that sense, um, what are the, the success factors there? It is, um, it is clarity for all stakeholders. Yeah, they, there's a clear direction, a North Star. I think that was what, what many stakeholders were looking for um, because they could develop their own standards, but they didn't know would it comply. And the second thing is probably very clear technical benchmarks. Yeah, you, you have to have a, a clear goal. It's 30% of reused material in every new construction. Bam, it's a material passport for every building plus 5,000 square meter. That's crystal clear. Everyone understands that and can work towards that because the intelligence and the, the engineering capacity or design capacity is there. But you need to have that very clear, that very clear target. And in that sense, I believe those frameworks um, that we've been seeing in the, um, in, in the Europe region um, will also become a blueprint for other global regions, and that will ultimately accelerate that transition. Thanks, Martin. Nick, what are the, from a client perspective, what are the system enablers from, uh, that you think will make this really mainstream? Yeah, so um, I, I mentioned tools um, as a way to essentially kind of reduce the problem space here. You know, it's, it's quite easy to talk about the circular economy. It's much more difficult to find practical solutions to allow you to apply it to your building specifications and to your operations. 
Um, and the kinds of tools which allow us to do that are things like life cycle analysis packages where we can make um, informed decisions about the trade-offs of various different types of material. So, you know, you, you may be able to get your hands on some recycled steel uh, for a project, but if it comes from the far side of Europe and the transport emissions are significantly higher, then actually it might be better to use something which has less recycled content, but is located in somewhere closer to where you are. So I, I think finding a way to, um, to, to reduce the problem space and to be able to talk in a language which clients are increasingly familiar with, which is carbon and embedded carbon in this case is, um, is I think the means, especially on the development and the planning side to do it. I think on the, um, on the operational side, um, as May has uh, uh, been able to demonstrate, you know, there are uh, practical solutions already out there to address specific issues and clearly that's what clients are looking for. Great, thanks, Nick. We're out of time, I'm afraid, and there are a few questions we've not been able to answer. So apologies to those that we've not been able to get to, but I had to pick the big themes. Um, this has been an excellent hour, a great start to a Thursday. So thank you very much to our speakers. I'm sure you can hear and feel the love from our delegates um, who are listening in. Um, thank you to Savills sponsoring this series of webinars. Uh, it's great to have your support. And I encourage everyone, I've just dropped a link into the chat to go to the uh, Cambridge University Land Society website to find out what's next in this series of webinars, which are very well uh, attended and very well hosted. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our delegates. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank you.